I'm not able to uh, based on the based on the onset, it can be either acute or subacute. Based on the inquiry, it could be of infectious origin or non-infectious origin. Yes, based on the size. Lights are not moving. Yeah, what I suggest, no, Indu, you put your video off. Okay, ma'am. Put your video off. I think uh, internet is not very good. Switch off your video. Yes, yes, ma'am, I'm doing that. Yeah, now you start presenting. Full screen, full screen, please. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, based on the answer, it can be either acute or subacute, and based on the etiology, it could be infectious or non infectious. Based on the site, it can be of cranial origin or systemic causes could be the reason. Going to the causes, in case of infectious, acutely presenting, uh, feature, acutely presenting uh, conditions include viral flu, tropical fevers, like sinusitis, AOM, tonsillar abscess, dental infections, bacterial meningitis, and viral encephalitis. Non-infectious causes which can present as acute headache with acute headache and fever include autoimmune encephalitis, ADAM, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cerebral venous thrombosis, and CNS vasculitis. If the presentation of headache is chronic and with intermittent episodes of fever, it could be due to either infectious again, non-infectious origin. In case of infectious, it could be tuberculosis meningitis, HIV-related meningitis, fungal meningitis. It could be a subdural empyema or a brain abscess. Non causes along with a long uh, subacute onset of headache or chronic headache include hydrocephalus, brain neoplasms, CNS leukemias, SLE, and Bechet's disease. So, going to the clinical approach of child with fever and headache, the major thing is we should look for always for the red flag signs. The worst headache, the child presenting with altered sensorium, and child having a focal neurological deficit. All these things should point. Uh, having a, uh, a diagnosis which is a, of serious concern, so that needs to be investigated. So we have to perform a CT or MRI. If the patients are normal, then meningitis and look for uh, uh, lumbar, fun lumbar puncture and look for CSF analysis and also measure the sinus pressure. It could be also a pseudotumor cerebri. And if everything is normal and there is no etiological uh, clues towards the signs and symptoms directing a CNS cause, then specific histories are pointed towards specific uh, diseases as we saw in the list above. So next is, uh, uh, we'll see individual cases one by one. So first I want to talk about uh, acute otitis media. It's the most common application of a proceeding or concurrent viral upper respiratory infection. It occurs several days after the onset of upper respiratory infection. The viral infection enables the pathogenic bacteria. It actually impairs the host local defenses or causes a tube dysfunction. Thereby, it uh, facilitates the growth of bacteria. So, the factors that are associated with occurrence of arthritis, the age itself, actually, children between 12 months, less by 12 months, they will be having at least one episode has been reported in our almost 63 to 85 percentage of children. And almost by two years, up to 66 to 99 percentage of children may experience at least one episode of otitis media. So the age less than two years is a risk factor for acute otitis media. Gender-wise, it shows a male preponderance and uh, socioeconomic uh, factors also play a role. Exposure to to tobacco smoke and exposure to other children also play a factor. We all know that breastfeeding reduces the uh, uh, respiratory infections as such it reduces acute otitis media by 43 percentage. Cold climate season is more uh, uh, as a risk factor, acts as a risk factor for evident, uh, occurrence of acute otitis media. And also we have to check the vaccination status of the children, especially for pneumococcal as H influenza. Presence of craniofacial anomalies, especially children with uh, underpad cleft palate, submucosal cleft palate, and Down syndrome. In Down syndrome, there will be eustachian tube dysfunction, which will cause poor ventilation of the middle ear, and that can lead to acute otitis media. So, the other aids that predominate in acute otitis media include Streptococcus pneumoniae, non-typeable H influenza, and Moraxilla cataralis. 
post introduction of bcv vaccine this non typeable h influenza initially overtook the streptococcus pneumonia as a common pathogen and was being found in 40 to 50 percentage of cases and then this streptococcus pneumonia is not whichever is not covered by the conjugate they have started mg and now they are taking over this non typeable h influenza as the most common pathogens in studies Moraxella presents with the majority of the remaining cases, and uh, other pathogens include Staphylococcus and Staphylococcus aureus and Gram-negative organisms. These uh, group of organisms are predominantly seen in neonates less than two weeks of age. If you think of aureus infection in case of persistent otorrhea, especially after tympanostomy tube placement, and also some viral uh, causes or can be directly associated with alkytotitis media. It could be RSV, rhinovirus. influenza adenovirus and para influenza these viruses either be or acting as a predisposition factor for secondary bacterial infection can cause acute otitis media clinical presentation of acute otitis media includes fever rhinorrhea presence of ear pain as we commonly notice in the uh, emergency room child presenting with a pulling ear or we do ask the parents whether the child is uh, not allowing um, parents themselves may report that child is not allowing to touch but this symptom is known to be non specific and it is not sensitive to pick up a acute otitis media there, there could be presence of simultaneous erythematous uh, conjunctivitis especially with in h non typeable h influenza infection so how to make the diagnosis of acute otitis media so presence of moderate to severe bulging the tympanic membrane and new onset of otorrhea not due to otitis externa and there there could be a mild bulging of the tympanic membrane in the recent onset with less than 48 hours associated with significant tympanic membrane erythema or ear pain as we can see here this is normal tympanic membrane where it shows the uh, shiny appearance this tympanic membrane is little bit congested and here the third one shows fullness so this uh, guidelines is provided by american academy of uh, pediatrics in 2013 for diagnosis of otitis media for treatment purposes we need to know certain definitions especially we should need to know what is a severe disease it is defined as temperature of more than 39 degree celsius that or 102.2 fahrenheit associated with significant otalgia or toxic events and based on the age again less than 2 years is one category and more than 2 years is other category so for treatment wise we should provide first symptomatic treatment which include paracetamol and ibuprofen choice of antibiotic and then it depends on symptom severity and also the age group so generally there is a indication for antibiotic except for unilateral or otitis media without otorrhea and then bilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea in children more than 2 years in this case we offer to provide additional observation especially when the parents are also willing to come back for uh, reviews if they are well educated and informed we can even go for the additional observation during this additional observation over the next 48 to 72 hours if there is a failure it to improve or if the child is worse they can choose to provide an antibiotic so antibiotic choice of antibiotics either if we start as a initial treatment delay treatment after a period of uh, uh, i mean observation the first recommended antibiotic include amoxicillin kindly note those here they have give 80 to 90 mg per kg per day as a two divided doses or amoxicillin clavulanib especially when child has received amoxicillin in the recent 30 days amoxicillin adding clavulanib is more important so again the dose is 90 mg per kg per day of amoxicillin 6.4 mg per kg per day of clavulanib clavulanib as the alternative is ceftriaxone so after doing this initial treatment for initial treatment if the patient is penicillin allergic we can have choices like cefepidor cefuroxime and also follow with ceftriaxone if the first line antibiotic treatment has failed almost after 48 to 72 hours so we have to consider the second line antibiotic treatment if initially we had started with amoxicillin we can go for amoxicillin clavulanib we can add clavulanib and treat again if the first line treatment was amoxicillin clavulanib then go for ceftriaxone alternative treatment would be here uh, instead of amoxicillin clavulanib we can try ceftriaxone or clindamycin and also here also we can go for clindamycin and tympanospentesis we will come to the indication of tympanospentesis little later so so these are the antibiotic choices for managing acute otitis media in children both for initial therapy as well as 
failed treatment. So duration of antibiotics will be for 10 days. So the indications for miringotomy, that is uh, tympanostomy. So if there is refractory pain or hyperpyrexia, presence of indication of arthritis. Hello. Hindu, your screen went off. Okay, ma'am. Sorry. Now, where should I start from, ma'am? I think you were just talking about the uh, meringotomy. You could start from there again. Okay. I mean, uh, everybody's able to see the screen, ma'am. You just do resume slide slow on the top part of your screen, you see. Resume slide show. And I started sharing. Yeah, we can see that. Make it full screen. Yes, ma'am. I made full screen. No, it's not full screen. It's, it's just showing your slide. Yeah, yeah. Now it is okay. Yeah. You start from here again. Indications of meringotomy include refractory pain, hyperpyrexia, population of acute arthritis media like facial paralysis, mastoritis, labyrinthitis, or spread to central nervous system. Also, if the patient is immunologically compromised. And if the antibiotic course or two courses of antibiotic, even a primary and secondary therapy is also failed, then we can do this tympanostomy as a diagnostic twice by the organism, know the culture sensitivity, or as a therapeutic process for source control. Prevention of acute arthritis media include general measures like avoiding working, providing exclusive breastfeeding to the infants, avoiding environmental tobacco smoking, and vaccination of infants up to influenza and influenza. Proceed with the next question. The slides are not moving again. Indu, are you there? No, please proceed. Did I complete this one? Finished till here. Okay. And go to the next slide. So the preventive measures include general measures like avoiding and breastfeeding. Indu, since your uh, internet is very unstable, you put your video off. So uh, we move to the next point that is sinusitis. Sinusitis could be either of bacterial or viral origin. Approximately two I think she got disconnected again. Yeah, so what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share her presentation. Yeah. When she joins.
Just not be able to join also. There's some problem. Some signal error at her end. Doctor Indu, you've joined. It's showing us join. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah. So Indu, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share your presentation. Okay, ma'am. And you will just present from there, huh? Just wait. Can you see the presentation? Yes, ma'am. I'll uh, increase the zoom. Yeah, just one minute, okay? What is this? Yes, ma'am. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Next one, ma'am. So, uh, sinusitis is uh, mostly because of uh, viral as well as bacterial causes. Approximately 0.5 to 2 percentage of viral URIs are complicated by acute symptomatic bacterial sinusitis. So let's see the development of sinuses. So basically the ethmoidal and maxillary sinuses are present at birth, but only the ethmoidal sinuses are nematized. These maxillary sinuses gets nematized, uh, does not get nematized until four years of age. Uh, so the, till then the uh, chances of infection of maxillary sinuses is uh, very negligible. And then the sphenoid sinuses start, start uh, appearing by five years of age. Frontal sinuses will uh, develop uh, by seven to eight years of age, and this is not completely developed by adolescence. And these ostia are draining into the sinuses, which are very narrow, that is one to three millimeters, and they form an osteomeatal complex in the middle meatus of the nose. So any blockage, any small blockage in this small, uh, small osteomeatal opening can lead to stagnants of secretions and cause secondary infection. Normally, this paranasal sinuses, uh, the, the secretions of the paranasal sinuses are sterile. Then please click on the. Uh, this. So uh, as as we can see, so at birth there is only uh, maxillary and ethmoidal sinus. The ethmoidal uh, si the maxillary and ethmoidal sinus. The ethmoidal sinus is uh, uh, nematized at birth. The maxillary sinus by around five years of old, and uh, by around twelve years the phenoid uh, by five years, and uh, frontal by seven to eight years, and all that get well nematized by adolescence. So by definition, acute sinusitis is defined as. Uh, Sinusitis less than period of 30 days. The etiological agents include streptococcus pneumoniae, non, which is non typeable, that is around 30 percentage, and the H influenza con uh, constitutes for 20 percentage, and Moraxella uh, cateralis constitutes for 20 percentage. Out of these, approximately 50 percent of the H influenza infection and almost all the uh, Moraxella cateralis uh, infection uh, can are uh, beta lactamase uh, positive. 25 percent of the streptococcus pneumonia also may be penicillin resistant. The Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Anaerobe, these are noticed in, in case of uh, chronic sinusitis. Predisposition, con predisposing conditions for sinusitis. Presence of previous upper respiratory infections, uh, especially when the child children are attending a daycare or uh, presence of a school-going sibling, and previous pre-existence of allergic rhinitis, exposure to cigarette smoke, and children with previous immunodeficiencies, immunoglobulin G and uh, uh, IgA subclasses include abnormalities and uh, abnormalities of uh, phagocyte function, cystic fibrosis, ciliary dysfunction, and presence of gastroesophageal reflex. As we discussed for acute otitis media, here also anatomic defects play a role. Use of cocaine and uh, presence of nasal foreign bodies, immunosuppression either for bone marrow transplantation or malignancy. In these patients, there is a more risk for fungal pneumonia. In, uh, for example, it could be a aspergillus or mucor sinusitis. These may uh, even extend have an intracranial extension. Let's go into the pathogenesis of uh, sinusitis. Following a viral rhinitis, there could be a sinus mucosal inflammation because of which there is an associated uh, loss of ciliary, uh, kinea, uh, ciliary function. And uh, as such, uh, conditions associated with ciliary dyskinesia may also predispose. Other risk factors as we saw before, and uh, there is a uh, decreased local immune uh, defense function. So the, all these uh, will breach the uh, normal natural barrier. And because of release of inflammatory cytokines, the secretions will be increasing and lead to failure of uh, 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 drainage and uh, fluid collection because of mucosal swelling, as we saw already. And because of long-standing secretions, that uh, leads to the uh, site for growth of secondary bacteria. 
and this can lead to acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. Symptoms include fever, nasal discharge, hypoxemia, halitosis, periorbital edema. Adolescents, adolescent children may complain of headache. The pattern suggestive of sinusitis, in, it, uh, we have to know because it, it's difficult to differentiate from common code. So we should look for persistence of nasal congestion or rhinorrhea of any quality, especially presence of daytime cough for more than 10 days without any improvement. And also there could be severe symptoms. So temperature more than 39 degrees Celsius or 102 Fahrenheit associated with purulent nasal discharge at least for three days. Or it can be associated with worsening of symptoms or occurrence of new symptoms like a fever or nasal discharge associated with a daytime cough. Diagnosis is mainly clinical. Sinus aspirate culture is the only accurate method for diagnosis, but it is not practical, though it may be of use in immunocompetent patients, uh, especially when we suspect a fungal sinusitis. The rigid endoscopy is more useful in adults. It's not commonly useful in pediatric uh, children. And uh, plain uh, films, radiological features like presence of opacification, mucosal thickening, and presence of air and fluid level is not uh, diagnostic though. It is not recommended in children who are otherwise healthy. It only confirms the presence of sinus inflammation and it does not differentiate between a spiral bacterial or allergic cause of inflammation. So let's look at the treatment. About uh, 50 to 60% of children with bacterial sinusitis will recover without uh, antimicrobial therapy. Again, the the choice of treatment will be based on the clinical decision. So AAP recommends uh, antimicrobial treatment based on uh, if there is presence of severe onset, worsening course, especially to promote resolution of symptoms and to prevent suppurative complications. So these are the recommendations for initial use of antibiotic for acute bacterial sinusitis. Again, you have, here you can see the definition. The severe acute bacterial sinusitis. By definition, it is uh, uh, defined as temperature more than 39 associated with the thick nasal secretions and present consequently for all the three days. And worsening bacterial sinusitis that is defined as nasal discharge associated with daytime cough and sudden worsening of symptoms. Again, here also the fever will be present at least more than or equal to 38 degrees and substantial increase in the discharge of the cough. The persistent sinusitis is by definition is presence of symptom for more than 10 days without any improvement. So antibiotic therapy is indicated in most of the situations, except additional observation could be offered in children uh, in case of persistent sinusitis without any coexisting complications. Especially when complications are there or associated other in ENT infection are there, it is better to go for the antibiotic therapy. So if we notice a worsening or lack of improvement in, at 72 hours, and uh, feel, uh, we should start on the antibiotics. Again, here, if the initial management was given as observation, we have observed the child, we should start on the amoxicillin without clavulanate. But if we had earlier started on amoxicillin, we can step up to amoxicillin with the clavulanate. If previously itself the child had received a high dose amoxicillin clavulanate, then we should we could start on a clindamycin or cefixin uh, or linazolid uh, we can use. Sir. This clindamycin is recommended to cover penicillin resistant, penicillin resistant streptococcus pneumonia. As we saw, almost 50% of uh, uh, streptococcus pneumonia will be having uh, this beta lactamase. If again, there is a lack of improvement of seven, within 72 hours, if we can provide additional observation and or uh, provide initial initiate antibiotics. Sir. Additional observation, if there is a, a high dose, if high dose uh, amoxicillin clavulanate is going on, again, we have to make a shared decision making, we can continue the same and uh, have a watchful expectation if unless the child is developing any complications. So, so again, uh, in case of uh, uh, this thing, if high dose tamoxylin clavulanate was given initially, then we can continue the same thing, uh, high dose or go for clindamycin. So this is the uh, subprescribed protocol by Infectious Disease uh, Society of America. So as we saw, if there is a persistent and not improving symptoms or if there are severe symptoms or there is worsening, there is double sickening initially showing a brief period of improvement and then worsening. So, and we also should evaluate for the presence of risk factors like age less than two years, attending daycare on prior exposure to antibiotic within the past one month or prior hospitalization, presence of immunocompromised status. If all these things, if the question is yes, then we can start on antimicrobial therapy. 
if uh, otherwise we can wait for the symptomatic management and then you uh, initiate a first line antibiotic therapy again you should note for improvement if the improvement is there complete the course of therapy if no improvement is there then go for next class of antibiotic therapy even if after two courses the antibiotics uh, two courses of antibiotics if there's no significant improvement or worsening then go for investigation ct or mri to look for invasion So the complications of sinusitis, it can extend to uh, either uh, brain or it can extend to the orbit. So here we can see that there is a intraorbital extension with the showing air and fluid levels and uh, intracranial extension causing subdural empyema. So we should be watchful of these complications. So whether there is a role of adjuvant therapies in acute uncomplicated sinusitis. As such, there is no recommendation for deep conditions anti-histaminics, mucolytics, and intranasal corticosteroids. In uh, whatever the studies done adequately in children, there is no recommendation. And uh, there is also for saline nasal spray or, wash, or washes, it can actually liquefy the secretions and act as mild vasoconstrictor, but the, even this also is not been systematically evaluated in children. So next condition, uh, we'll discuss about influenza. It's also present, uh, otherwise uh, commonly called as a flu. It's also present with fever, headache, chills, and rigor. So this is a previous pandemic which the world has been facing before this COVID thing. So this is also caused by the single standard RNA virus belonging to the family orthomyxoviridae. And uh, there are three genera, A, B, and C, of which the A and B are the primary immune pathogens. Especially this A virus is the one which is undergoing repeated antigenic variations. So as we can see the uh, uh, this thing structure of uh, influenza, we can notice uh, the two different spike proteins like a uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Based on the antigenic variations in this uh, hemagglutinin and neuro, uh, neuraminidase, there are different uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, subtypes there of uh, influenza virus that can emerge. So how, how to name these uh, subtypes is, so whenever they uh, isolate one particular this thing, first they mention about the geographical area, uh, first they tell influence by A or B, then the geographical area, and then uh, which uh, this thing, isolate number and the year of isolation, and then which type of uh, uh, this thing, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So the HA hemagglutinin and neuraminidase antigens from B and C have le uh, less variation. Uh, so they show the less variations among the B and C. These are primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets, contact with the small as a contact with secretions or small cortical aerosols. The incubation period is short, can range from 12 to 72 hours. So we can notice the uh, distinct se uh, seasonal differences. Uh, in northern hemisphere, it is between October to March. In southern hemisphere, it is seasonal between uh, April to August. In tropical countries, throughout the year. In India, there is a mixed climate. So some areas fall under the tropical climate, some area will fall under the northern hemisphere. So the influenza circulation usually peaks during the monsoon season, that is between June and September. And then there is a break for a brief period, again, only to start from November to February. So why the importance of knowing this uh, seasonal variation is we have to, previously we have to vaccinate the children and uh, they should have the appropriate antibodies uh, by the time the season arrives. So here we can see uh, the pathogenesis of influenza. It gets attached to the ciliated columnar epithelial cells in the respiratory tract. The hexosaminidase is help to, uh, helps to attach in the sialic acid residues. And this virus is as such adsorbed into the uh, cell and replication starts within four to six hours. Then new infection, uh, new viruses are released. Again, they start infecting the neighboring uh, cells and it spreads very rapidly. It causes slight in, uh, infection of the respiratory epithelium and causes loss of ciliary function decreases mucosal protection and destamination of epithelial layer. All these can directly lead to severe respiratory distress, failure, hypoxia, or secondary bacterial infections. Clinical presentation includes sudden onset of fever, chills, myalgia, headache, fatigue, abdominal pain, and vomiting. Diarrhea may also occur. Diarrhea is reported most often during the 2009 episodes, 2009 uh, pandemic with H1N1 compared to the seasonal influenza. Subsequently, after the respiratory symptom onset, there could be sore throat, pharyngitis, nasal congestion, 
rhinitis and non productive cough cervical lymphadenopathy and conjunctivitis can also occur the diagnosis is based on epidemiological clinical and laboratory consideration there are availability of rapid influenza diagnostic tests the sensitivity of test is generally somewhere between 50 to 70% although there is a range of 10 to 80% though the specificity is high 95 to 100 percentage therefore the false negative test uh, results may occur more commonly than the false positive results so hence when there is a clinical suspicion for the patient with influenza the treatment should be started empirically regardless of the diagnostic test result so uh, other viruses which can cause a similar flu like illness include respiratory syncytial virus para influenza virus human metanemo virus adenovirus and rhinovirus so as we saw the laboratory testing methods include the rapid test and then uh, using immunofluorescence direct uh, dfp or in, uh, uh, in, in indirect immunofluorescence and then rt pcr rt pcr you can use a nasopharyngeal swab or throat swab generally the reports may be available within 1 to 6 hours this has got excellent sensitivity and relatively rapid uh, turn around so this is the most common method that which we employ in our country other tests include viral cell and serological test which is not generally recommended so the high risk individuals who can get a uh, uh, morbid condition with influenza infection include again here also children less than 2 years of age chronic pulmonary conditions including asthma chronic cardiovascular condition except hypertension renal and hepatic conditions hematologic diseases including sickle cell disease metabolic disorder including diabetes mellitus presence of pre existent neurological abnormalities children with immunosuppression or caused by medications or by hiv adolescents who are pregnant or postpartum persons younger than 19 years of age who are receiving long term aspirin therapy native american indians or alaskan natives and persons who are morbidly obese and residents of long term care facilities the complications of influenza infection could include otitis acute otitis media pneumonia myocarditis gulen bar syndrome can also present with encephalitis influenza type b is noticed to uh, develop muscle weakness cough pain and occasionally it can cause myoglobinuria also and uh, we all know that uh, use of salicylates in influenza can cause rice syndrome treatment includes rest and supportive care treatment of secondary bacterial infections the neuromediase inhibitors which are available are oseltamivir and zanamivir oseltamivir is a oral drug can be used from 2 weeks of age and zanamivir is available as a inhalational form it can be used from 7 years onwards it can reduce the duration of symptoms and the likelihood of complication clinical benefit is greatest when the antiviral treatment is administered within 48 hours of onset so that is why decision for starting antiviral should not be waiting for should not wait for the laboratory confirmation so uh, if, uh, if we see the recommended dosage we know that for oseltamivir for treatment dose it is given as a bd dose and for prophylaxis it is given as a once a daily dosage there is a age based dosing criteria which is available similarly for zanamivir nebulization also uh, inhalations are available uh, from 7 years for age based criteria is available both for treatment as well as prophylaxis so uh, regarding the prevention the vaccines will be usually available by late summer and before the early fall of every year so we, they have got a excellent safety profile most often the side effects will be like only a uh, soreness redness or tenderness at the site of injection and sometimes nasal congestion in case of nasal spray so the vaccine which are available are live ad, live attenuated influenza virus vaccine inactivated influenza virus vaccine and recombinant influenza which is the latest one so the cdc recommendations of for uh, injectable influenza vaccine that uh, it's for me recommended for higher groups high risk groups who are in long term facilities the age group between 2 to 64 years with uh, comorbid conditions children uh, age 6 months to 4 years and women who will be pregnant during the influenza season contact households of the home caregivers and uh, if patient has not received the vaccine uh, during the time of uh, h1n1 2009 they have to get 
two doses at least four weeks apart because this has got a different structure. So if they are not exposed to this, they, they should be two doses. So the live uh, vaccines, uh, as we discussed, the live attenuated vaccine, it is not uh, recommended for children less than two years of age because they can develop a high risk for influenza related complication. So it is not safe to recommend it under them. Inactivated influenza injectable vaccine intramuscularly that, available, that is available now as a trivalent vaccine. It contains influenza A strain and one influenza B strain. And there is also a quadrivalent vaccine which is called IIV4. So it contains a second another strain of influenza B vaccine which is anti diabetes of antinically distinct lineage. It's a gram negative bacterium, it is highly adapted to immunoglobulins and so Indu, we can't hear you. Ma'am, let's take the presentation and complete it in the next session. I think there is a lot of uh, trouble at her end. Yes, yes. I think that's a big problem. <laughs>